Okay, so welcome to workshop four. We're uh, learning how to take care of our plants today. Um, it's been exciting to see all our radishes, basil, tomatoes, onions, um, lettuce growing, and let's see how we um, can help them thrive. So uh, just wanted to share out some announcements. Um, continue to share your experience on Instagram if you like. Um, and then sharing from our poll from last week, we will decide to, um, we've created a Canvas discussion board for you all to share your recipes that you would like to try. So please share out um, different recipes and we'll have a vote on it next week. Um, we also will, um, just reviewing from last week, um, who remembers what the, what's the difference between transplanting and planting? What's the difference between planting maybe with our seeds and transplanting seedlings? With our plants and transplanting, you can feel free to type in the chat box, but with plants, we want to, we can plant seeds directly in the soil. Transplanting, we can have seedlings that maybe are pressed for space and we can plant them in bigger containers and we can consider different timing and temperature options, right? Um, so we are also gonna be talking about um, warm season versus cool season crops. So another question, what about this? Can you guys see if this is a tomato? Type in the chat box if you know if this is a warm season or a cool season crop. This is um, really helpful to um, consult the vegetable um, planting guide and um, this will be helpful for our breakout or our projects later on. Warm season, nice, yes. Um, because their fruit, yeah, uh, generally the fruit or the seed uh, vegetables are in the warm season and they are harvested in the warm season. What about these root veggies? Kind of like the radishes we have or carrots, turnips, um, also leafy greens. Are they warm season or cool season? One tip I have is like for the radishes, lettuce, right? We I, um, suggested planting them or placing them in the shade because they are, they prefer cooler seasons. So that's something just to note um, as we are going forward with our projects. Yeah, so we'll be get, giving more information about it later at the end of this workshop, but just wanted to start off with that. And then these are objectives that we as instructors have carefully just clarified um, as pre uh, we prepare for these workshops and we want to share them with you all too, um, because we believe in this, we want to make these workshops as engaging as possible and just have the space for you all to be active drivers of your own education. So sharing with these, with you all, we want to, um, we'll be going over the different materials needed to make compost and see the role of composting um, to complete this nutrient cycle, right? And then for our gardening demo, we'll be talking about basic plant needs. And then we hope that by this demonstration, you all are able to um, assess your own plants and see what it needs. Maybe we need to adapt to different um, the lighting, right, or like nutrients, what does it need so that um, we can help them thrive. So getting started, we want to check in with ourselves, especially as midterms are coming up, it's getting busy. Please type in the chat box two words that describe how you are feeling now. Good to see, yeah. Um, it sounds like we all can do with some more rest, right, and maybe some more sleep, but also um, seems like we're in good moods as well. Thanks for sharing, yeah. And then feel free to tap in the chat box one self-care method you like. As we mentioned, um, as we're learning to take care of our ceilings, and I hope you have been feeling this too, experiencing the calm and also the peace that comes from taking care of other um, plants and um, just relating that to how can we take care of ourselves too in the same with the same love and grace. Mm, watch movies, taking walks, yoga, running. Oh, same. Um, sleep for sure. Yeah. So please type in the chat box one of one self care method that you really like, um, that really nourishes you. You know, that um, helps you rejuvenate, especially as we are working really hard as students. Mm, I love those. 
All right. Well, um, I, Anka, am I forgetting anything else? I think that was it. Um, we will jump into our presentation. Anka, are you good? I think I, I took your spot, but <laughs> I guess I'll just take it on. Um, yeah, so we, how can we take care of our plants? How does this connect to our guest speakers that we have for today? Who here has heard of compost? Or, um, What's, or comp what's composting about? If not, we're in for a treat because Project Compost will be sharing with us. Um, how does composting tie with how we take care of our plants? We'll soon find out. So Project Compost and Campus Center for the Environment are two organizations on campus. Cedar and Carl are here today. So um, we'll be hearing from them. Yeah, should I start? Uh, yes, please. All right, yeah, I'm Cedar and I use they, them pronouns. My major is sustainable agriculture and food systems. I'm graduating this quarter. And um, fun fact, I've been really enjoying eating the snap peas in the garden right now. I'm also an intern at the ecological garden on campus and we have snap peas growing like crazy. Um, it's a really fun uh, early spring vegetable that you can snack on even as everything else is still growing. Thank you for that. Congratulations. Um, yeah, Carl. Yeah, and my name is Carl. I'm the unit director for Campus Center for the Environment. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. I'm a third year environmental engineer. And a fun fact about me is that I'm from Chile. I'm not a uh, international student, but I moved here when I was 14. Okay, so before we move into talking more about the uh, need details about compost, uh, I think it would be good to talk a little bit more about Project Compost itself as an organization and uh, CCE so that everyone has a better understanding. So Project Compost is one of the units within CCE. We have two more units, uh, Project Garden and Project Challenge. And the image on top, it's the location where we usually meet. Um, right now, we're not currently meeting on person because of COVID, but uh, I believe about a year ago or so, we used to meet at the Eco Hub, uh, which is at the cell if anyone uh, is aware of that area or has been there before. Uh, we're also part of ASUCD, so the Association of Students of UC Davis um, were one of the units. And for example, one of the units are the coho, the pantry, uh, unit trans are well-known well -known units and we're just one of them, one smaller, smaller unit within AC City. Um, and what Project Compost does, um, once they get one of our um, student-run organizations is kind of picture here on the images below. So the first thing we do is collect compost. So we serve many facilities on campus, such as the coho, the pantry, uh, coffee labs, et cetera. And then we, we get volunteers to drive this little truck. Uh, next year, it will be bikes, um, just because it will, it will work better for us. Uh, but we pretty much take the bins that we collect from those facilities to our compost pile, which is the second picture. And then we drop them there um, and then we have uh, we, we flip them with a tractor um, weekly, we water it, we take care of it so that we can produce quality compost. And then the third picture uh, on your right, it's kind of the end product. So we have our compost pile uh, ready, ready to go. Sometimes we donate it to the community garden or the eco garden or people around the area. Sometimes people come from Woodland uh, to take some of our compost uh, or again places nearby. Uh, and sometimes we try to sell it. We've been to plant sales. Uh, we're trying to get a place at the farmer's market to see if that would be possible. Um, or yeah, any, anywhere we can sell compost. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what we do um, as, a, as an organization here on campus. Yeah, 
Thank you, Carl. And also wanted to say that um, if anyone is interested in getting involved in Project Compost or any of the other projects, you can definitely reach out. And because um, once things are kind of back up and running, we will be looking for volunteers and things. So it's a really uh, fun thing to be a part of and you can make a difference, so. Um, and I can talk about um, some basics of home composting systems. There's, and also feel free to chime in if you have questions or anything or put them in the chat. Um, there's kind of three main things that I think of for backyard composting. One is aerobic compost, and that's kind of the more common backyard composting method, which is where you have basically just a big pile of your stuff and it, you turn it regularly so that it has oxygen and um, uh, yeah, the picture here is like a three bin system. And so it's getting turned um, maybe like once a week or so to the next pile. And that's how it's getting oxygen into the system. That's why it's called aerobic. If it was anaerobic, it would be releasing a smell and you would notice, and that's actually releasing greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and we don't want that. That's what happens when things go to the landfill. And um, as for your question, Anka, it depends um, how long it takes for compost to be ready. If you're turning it regularly, it can be done um, fairly quickly, I would say in an aerobic composting pile that is um, kind of on the larger side, it could be like a month. And um, that's like in the fast paced summer months because uh, things just move slower in the winter. And so it could be longer in that time. But yeah, it, it just depends on how you're caring for it. And another composting method that I'm going to talk more about is vermicompost, and that's using worms. And um, another method, some other methods that people use are different kinds of animal composting, such as chickens or rabbits or guinea pigs. Um, there's a bunch of different animals that people use, um, the small animals, that produce really nutrient-rich manure um, that then you compost again to kind of get rid of the bad bacteria and microbes so that it's safe for your garden. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So um, for aerobic compost, a system that you would have in your backyard, there's two main ingredients that you are going to be adding and those are carbon and nitrogen, um, known also as the brown and green material. The brown material is the carbon, and those are the dry, dead, um, dry and dry, dry, dead materials such as like dry leaves, um, straw, newspaper, things like that. Um, that's made out of carbon, and the green material is the nitrogen, which is that fresh food waste or fresh green garden waste, or um, coffee grounds are really good. Those are all really high in nitrogen and you need both of those for a successful compost. Um, if you are noticing that your compost smells bad, as I said, that's a bad sign, but it's not, um, it's not something that you can't deal with. Um, if you notice that it smells bad, it probably just needs more carbon material. So maybe add more straw or more newspaper. Um, it could be that you need to turn it more regularly and it's starting to go anaerobic. And I think it's just a really good practice to just pay attention and learn from your pile as you go along. Um, of course, there's a lot of resources out there to kind of guide you, but I think it's, um, a really good practice to in observation and um, learning what your pile needs as you go. And if you stick to this kind of basic guideline of like a little more brown to green, you should be pretty good. And if you're turning it regularly, you should be pretty good. 
and you can add almost anything uh, to the pile, except people tend to shy away from putting uh, like meat products and dairy things because they decompose a little slower and because of that, it can attract like rodents and things. So people usually stick to plant products. Okay, you can go to the next slide. And in a vermicomposting system, I, I think vermicomposting is really great if you live in an apartment or you don't have a lot of backyard space or you're just not doing a lot of, um, like a lot of gardening because um, it's easy to have like a small bin if you only have a little bit of waste that you're producing. And this is the bin that I have at my house. It's just a plastic tote that I found on the side of the road. And um, I thought it would be perfect for having my worm compost in. So you can set it up in a lot of different ways, but this is how I've done it. Basically what you need, no matter what you're doing, is a carbon bedding, which I used um, like shredded newspaper and some straw. You need a grit material, which I just used dirt. Um, the grit is important and necessary for the worms because they don't have teeth to grind um, any of the food. So they actually have that grit, they have that inside of them and that helps to grind up the, the food more. Um, the food material would be kitchen waste usually, um, food waste, vegetable scraps and things. And then of course you need your worms. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can go to that. Here, I, I can just wanted to show that um, I have my newspaper on top and a layer of straw. And then underneath is where the active composting is happening. I dig in and see that there's a lot of worms. I ordered my worms online um, and you can do that. I, um, or if you have a friend who has a worm bin, um, there's so many worms in there. Like, that they would probably be able to give you some and the population replenishes really quickly. But you can order them online. Um, yeah, so you can see all of the worms in there and uh, there's also some bugs and things and that's totally fine. Like as long as they're not over competing with the worms, it's usually okay to have some bugs and different things in there because they're all kind of working towards the same goal. They're all breaking this food down and having an ecosystem that is more than just the worms is really important because the worms don't have teeth, going back to that point. Um, they need these other microbes and fungi to break the food down to be digestible for them. So, don't worry if you see some bugs and things. If you're squeamish about that, you can keep it outside. Um, just make sure you keep it in the shade so it doesn't overheat and you should be good. Okay, next slide. And uh, so this is what you end up with at the end. It's this really, really nutrient dense material that you can add to your garden beds um, or even your indoor plants. I, I, um, I put some in my house plants and they've been popping off like crazy, they love it. And so any, any plants that you have, they're gonna, they're gonna eat this up and it's gonna be great. Not only is it adding like those beneficial nutrients, it's also adding microbes and fungi to the soil and these different organisms that are also really, really important for the soil microbiome. Yeah, you can play that video. Um, I just wanted to show that um, this worked really well for me to harvest the castings. Um, you can see that when I dig into this side of the bin, there's really very few worms. And that's because I started adding food to only one side of the bin. And over time, the worms started moving to that side and they've left this side 
open for me to harvest from. And that doesn't always work. Um, I, Bora was saying that uh, she tried that and it didn't really work for her, but um, there's different ways to, to do that. Um, uh, people sometimes make balls of the castings, like squish it together and they stick together kind of like a wet soil. And you can sit that out in the sun and the worms will start, will start to burrow into the middle and then you can open it up and just kind of pick the worms out and put them back in your bin. Or you can hand pick the worms out. You know, you always have to hand pick some worms out no matter what. But to use the castings, um, I like to just mix a few handfuls of it with water, um, dilute them, dilute the castings with water so that I can pour it around the edges of my plants or just on top of the plants. And that will um, bring the nutrients down into the soil. Because if you just sprinkle the castings on top of the soil, sometimes um, they'll dry out too fast and they won't get, get uh, down into the roots of the plants enough. So it's really important to water it in. And um, I also wanted to mention that uh, by using these different methods of composting, you're all, you're working towards this goal of closing the nutrient loop, right? Um, you're growing food out of the soil and that is gonna be depleting the soil of these nutrients. Um, and so adding compost back using the, the waste material from the plants that you grew is gonna be a really sustainable way to replenish that nutrients in the soil that um, those plants took up. And um, yeah, okay. I guess we can go to Q&A now because I'm gonna keep rambling. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Any questions? Will the ink on newspapers affect the compost? Ooh, good question. Um, yeah, good question. I think that some people say, yeah, some people say no. I, I wouldn't use, um, I guess I would go for a newspaper that doesn't have too much ink on it if that's worrisome. Um, but I think it's kind of fine. Like I wouldn't use the, the like shiny newspaper, um, but yeah. Good question. Any other questions? Nice. I have a question. Um, what kind of worms do you use for a vermicomposting bin? Oh yeah, um, they're red wigglers. And those are the most common to use for vermicomposting because they, uh, they're able to go through food waste really quickly and they can um, process a lot of it really quickly. So that's why red wigglers are pretty common. But they don't, uh, you can find them out in the garden in general, but they do require a lot of organic waste. So you don't usually find them out in the garden, you usually find earthworms out in the garden. That's why you kind of have to look for them. Mm. Nice. Um, well, yeah. yeah, I answered the question about can you put acidic things like lemons? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Generally, no, not advised, but you can. <laughs> I have in the past. Yeah, I would just like if you add anything, it's all about just observing what happens when you do put it in. If their worms aren't going for it, then you know, like, not to put that in again, but you can just kind of learn from them by observing. All right. Well, we have a question for you. What are two main components of compost? This is everyone. As a review, what are the two main components of compost? What goes in? There are a couple ways to say it. Mm, browns and greens, which also stand for 
carbon and nitrogen. Perfect. Great job. Yeah, Cindy and Huda. Yeah, and composting is super important. I never really understood why in college everyone was like raving about it, but as plants go from seed to seedling, right? And then what else happens? They grow leaves, flowers, fruit, right? But in this food chain, in this fruit, uh, new, uh, in this cycle, what happens with all those nutrients if we do not compost the food scraps or the veggie scraps? It just ends up in the landfill. And so it's like super cool that worms and also all these different detrivores can take a part in decomposing so that the soil can rebuild and be replenishing their nutrients. Well, um, and then one other question leading to our presentation. Um, what are four things that plants need? Name four things that plants need. And type this into the chat box. Uh, this is also kind of our stretch break. Feel free to get up a little bit before we um, Anka starts her presentation in a bit. But yes, carbon, sunlight, water. What else? What are some things that plants need? Anything else? sunlight to photosynthesize, water to hydrate, soil, nice, space, mm, good one. Space to grow, they definitely need that. We said four things, but we said um, water, soil, where they get nutrients, um, sunlight to draw energy from the sun because they photosynthesize, and something that we, we also do as humans, is air. Yeah. So, so I think, I don't know if Katie said carbon. Um, yeah. So plants also need air to breathe. Okay. Well, um, Anka will be jumping into our presentation and for the demo um, that we will do in our breakout groups too. All right. Can everyone see this okay? Hopefully. Um, yeah. All right. So we mentioned some of the things that plants need. Um, the very good answers, indeed. They need water, right? They need air, um, both oxygen and carbon dioxide. We'll get to that a little bit. They also need light, right, to photosynthesize. They have different temperature needs. And I think Bora mentioned earlier that radishes and lettuce and onions don't need uh, very high temperature, whereas tomatoes and uh, peppers and melons will need uh, higher temperatures to, to develop properly and to fruit, right? Um, they also need a uh, room to grow, like in our case, um, uh, platter boxes or pots. And they also need food, right? Fertilizer. Um, and um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, um, Ed Cedar mentioned uh, compost, which is a very good option. Um, in terms of air, Plants need um, air during the day, they're gonna take in um, carbon dioxide and produce oxygen, but at night they breathe just like we do. Um, and it's important to know that roots need to breathe as well. So when you water them, you wanna keep in mind that um, there shouldn't be too much water like logged in, in the soil, otherwise the, the roots are gonna die and then eventually the, the, the plant will die as well. Um, in terms of water, um, water, well, plants need water um, depending on, on the stage they're in. When they're very small, they don't need that much water. When they're fruiting, they need a lot more water. And um, they're, well, there's the, the best way to figure out how much water plants need, and, and I'll do a small demonstration afterwards, is, is to use a soil moisture uh, meter, right? Um, if you could tell me what you think the issue with the plant on the left is. They're both tomatoes, by the way, and we have, we're growing tomatoes as well, right? What do you think the problem with the plant on the left is? If you could type it in the chat, that would be, that would be awesome. If Sam says overwatered. Okay, that, yes, that is definitely one possibility. What else could it be?
Well, it could actually be underwater, right? It's wilted so that um, the sad thing is that we can't really know just by looking at it, if it's uh, underwater, over water, we, we need to check the soil and see if it smells bad. If it's very moist and the plant looks like this, it means that the soil is waterlogged and um, we need to, to, to let the soil dry um, and hopefully the plant will recover, right? If the soil is dry, then we need to add water. Um, so these are some, some healthy looking plants here on the right. Um, um, so yeah, like I mentioned before, the roots need uh, to breathe too and overwatering can cause root rot. Um, if you have uh, compost, that's fantastic. Um, if you don't, uh, you need to fertilize your plants um, and they need macronutrients like NPK. Can anybody tell me what these stand for? Um, if you could type it in the chat, that'd be awesome. No, nobody knows? <laughs> we briefly talked about N earlier. Okay, so Ooh, N, nice. sorry? Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Okay, perfect, excellent. All right, and then we also need magnesium and calcium, and then these micronutrients, a little bit less zinc and, and iron and, and the others, right? So um, plants really need these in order to, to develop properly. And these are all uh, tomato leaves that have different types of deficiencies. Like this is what a, a plant looks like when it doesn't have enough nitrogen. It, it's sort of um, uh, light green or even yellow, right? Um, and, and you can look some of these pictures up for, for your plant to see uh, if they have any deficiencies, right? Um, in terms of light, if we look at, at, the, at these pictures, can, can anybody tell me what they think the issues are with these two pictures? Uh, what's the problem on the left and why that might be? And then the problem on, on the picture on the right and why that might be. No, no ideas? Well, here, um, okay. Uh, somebody raise their hand. Okay. Um, okay. Crowding. That's interesting. Okay. Well, um, the issue with these uh, small ceilings over here is that they're not getting enough light. So they're what they call, what people call leggy. They're very long and very thin and very fragile. Um, so they're, they're stretching in order to, to reach the sun. And you can see that the leaves are a little bit yellowish. Um, so ideally, it, they need to be in the sun, right? Um, uh, these plants over here, which are tomatoes, um, their main issue is that they don't have any fruit. They're quite big, so they should have fruit already, but because they're not getting enough light, they haven't set any fruit. And remember that tomatoes need about six hours of direct sunlight in order to, to bear fruit. Uh, so plants really, really need uh, light. That's very important. Um, so I mentioned um, earlier that I was going to talk a little bit about water and um, how much uh, to water your plants. Uh, one, let's say, rule of thumb that people use is to insert their finger in, um, into the pot um, and feel the top inch of soil, but that's not gonna give you a very accurate measurement of um, um, of the amount of water at the root level. So ideally you would have a um, moisture meter, something like this, uh, very, very cheap, uh, nothing too fancy. And I'll, I'll show you how to use it. You just uh, push it in the pot all the way down and you can see over here, uh, oops, hopefully, uh, that my plants are okay-ish, you can wait for a little bit to, for it to stabilize. Um, I could uh, add a little bit of water. Um, so this will very accurately tell you if your plants uh, need water or not. Um, if your plants are sitting in the sun, they will need to be watered more frequently, sometimes uh, every day if it's, if it's hot outside, all right? Um, and the second thing that I would like to do is show you how to use fertilizer. We've given you some fertilizers. They're different from what I have, but um, um, it's very important to look 
but the label, right? You do not want to um, put too much fertilizer. You need to, to get the dosage just right. And um, all of them are going to say what kind of nutrients they contain and how much you should um, um, for like how much you should dilute them, right? Like uh, I believe that uh, the one that you have needs to be five uh, milliliters per gallon if you're adding it as a liquid to the roots and between 20 and 40 um, milliliters if you're going to use it at a spray. Um, you cannot use it just yet because um, uh, your plants are still small. Uh, lettuce can be fertilized uh, three weeks after transplanting. Uh, tomatoes, when they're around one month after transplanting. But for the sake of demonstration, I will um, I'll uh, do that for my um, basil seedlings here. And let's show them to you. Here they are. Um, I have measured uh, the type of fertilizer that you have. This is about 1.5 milliliters. And it fits uh, almost, um, it fills this flat teaspoon that I have. Um, actually, I'm gonna pour it back because it's easier to pour. Um, I'm gonna take my spray bottle, pour it in. Um, this one has a half a liter capacity, 500 milliliters. Sorry for being European here. Um, I'm just gonna pour in half a liter. Check, okay, it's a little bit more. So you get the idea. All right, well, it's good. Um, need to mix it a little bit and then spray it a couple of times. And then that should be good. Um, since you cannot spray your plants right now, you can use that for other plants that you have in the house. Um, but starting uh, two weeks from now, you can uh, you can use that for your plants. Um, and I have a different kind of fertilizer. Um, this one over here, it's an organic fertilizer. Um, the dosage is uh, to 25 milliliters per two liters. So I've measured about six uh, milliliters. This is what I need for my flask over here. I'm just gonna pour it in. As you can see, it's very, very dense. Um, I'm gonna add half a liter of water. Okay. And this one is uh, gonna show me when I get there. Quite dark, as you can see. Um, try to mix it up so that it uh, has an even concentration. And then you're just going to want to pour a little bit over. Uh, hopefully, you can see that. And uh, that is it. Now, if you have any questions, uh, we can answer those, or you can try uh to uh do the mix yourself in breakout rooms um and uh, we would also like to ask you to work with your mentors on um doing a uh summer garden design uh you're gonna get a little more information from them but basically just think what plants you would like to have in your garden and try to to set up a nice uh a nice design for that we are going to present these next week in our fifth uh, workshop. All right, Bora, I think we can uh, send everyone to break our Yeah, and any questions go. with that? Well, I'll be dispersing you into groups with your mentors too. So feel free to ask, um, reach out. And then we'll have breakout groups for like 10 minutes. Ooh, how much sun should my radishes and lettuce be getting? That'll be a great question. I think Laura can answer you, um, Samantha. Uh, okay, hopefully this all works. Let me know if you don't have a group. No, Cedar and Carl, um, I'm not going to put you in groups unless you guys want to check out another um, group and see what they're talking about with their garden. Uh, 
some announcements. Next week's workshop is going to be on pest management. We saw some survey, um, the midpoint survey, and saw students asking about basic, you know, how to take care of plants and ward off aphids, and also have a basic um, presentation on that from a master gardener volunteer. And then uh, we'll have time for our student presentations. It's like design your own summer garden. So we uh, have connected you all. Um, you'll be working with your mentor and partner or partners, James and Jess, I, I put you together. Um, and then um, there are also some sample garden designs and more guidelines on Canvas. Um, presentations next week with your group will be like two to three minute share out. So it's totally not um, super, you know, like a rigid or structured of an assignment, but we have some guidelines for you. Um, and these are super, uh, we would love to um, tap into your, um, um, your wisdom and also your preferences for summer garden because we potentially have a community garden plot in the summer at the um, ASU City Community Garden. And we would love to maybe adapt these garden plans for the actual garden. Um, this is a sample garden design from Lauren, actually. She made this really lovely garden plan. Um, so you can see, like, she started thinking about where is the sunshine coming in? Where is it going to be? Where is it going to be the most sunny? And she's had tomatoes here, bell peppers, germination station, chili peppers. Those are great warm season crops. On the side, there's some herbs and basil, parsley. These are great companion plants, maybe to ward off pests and, you know, um, benefit um, the, the soil and plants. There's celery, carrots, scallions, lettuce. It looks like, oh, don't throw, regrow. <laughs> I have like that. Some strawberries needed to protect against birds. Strawberries are perennials. So that's a great um, crop to have year round. So this is an example of a sample garden design. I think, Lauren, you had this on your iPad, right? Yeah, yeah. I just had a good fun time drawing. I had a lot of fun. <laughs> Uh, mine is just hand drawn. So this is my three raised beds in the back. So you can have it like 10 by 10 foot plot, um, or you can have a raised beds um, and just specify your dimensions. For me, I had like um, a three, uh, three foot by three foot beds. And then I, I have in the shady corner, I have potatoes and then I have like lettuce and eggplants here. I have the alyssum flowers that um, I demoed in the first workshop that's going to be planted um, with the potatoes as companion plants. And then in the sunnier spot where it gets like a little bit more sunshine, <laughs> hopefully enough, I have tomatoes and peppers that are gonna really like the sun. And I have one long squash vine that's gonna, I'm gonna have trailing out. And then I have some lemon balm and um, basil thyme as herbs. So this is my sample. But definitely um, on Canvas, there are some more samples. You can do it on an Excel spreadsheet or PowerPoint or just upload a photo, um, however you'd like. But just make sure to um, work with your partner um, on that. Uh, on this, this is, these are the guidelines that are on Canvas. So some things to start thinking about. Warm season crops, ideally for the summer. Um, what kind of spacing will they need? For mine, I had like um, my plants spaced out every six inches or 12 inches, depending on how, what they look like when they mature. When, if, will I be planting or direct seeding um, or transplanting? And then how, like, how long will it take to mature? And that's, if I want watermelons in the summer, when do I need to start planting? Watermelons are gonna need like three months at least. So I want to start planting maybe now or next month, right? Any questions as you're looking through this? And again, all the resources are on Canvas.